Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode is very special. In memoriam of Pierre Pradervand, a wonderful guest who spoke about the power of blessing on my podcast back in 2019, in season one, which is no longer available. I have been notified by his team that Pierre passed away on July 26 at the age of 87. His messages about the power and art of blessing he shared with us on my podcast are deeply spiritual, rich, timeless pearls of wisdom. I feel that in this fast pace of life we are currently experiencing, even spirituality married with quantum science is a whirlpool of new knowledge, techniques and ideas that can be overwhelming. And so many of us just leave it all on the periphery of our vision as that's simply too much to deal with. The best way to deal with an overwhelm is to go back to basics. The almost forgotten power of blessing is the fundamental, if not primordial, manifestation tool with a direct line to the divine. What you are about to hear is an edited and remastered version of my interview with Pierre, which was originally published in two parts, Timeless, Powerful and From the Heart. A humanitarian, author and spiritual thinker, Pierre has touched hundreds of thousands of people across the world with his message about the gentle art of blessing that is an admirable force. You will find the original show notes, Pierre's biography and links to his website and books on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Thank you, Pierre, for a life of service. Please enjoy, in memoriam of Pierre Pradervand, The Power of Blessing. Today we have a very special episode. I trust that I find you in good spirit, literally, and I bless you from the bottom of my heart in your good health, abundance, loving connections with others, and the peace of mind. If you are intrigued by the title of this episode and why I am blessing you from the start, you will be captivated by what you are going to hear. There is so much more to a blessing than you have ever thought. Our very special guest, Pierre Pradervand, will explain it all. But first, allow me to introduce him. Pierre is a sociologist, author, spiritual thinker, speaker and workshop leader. He grew up in London and Geneva and studied at the Universities of Geneva, Bern and at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, before receiving a doctorate in sociology from La Sorbonne University. He has written 16 books, the most acclaimed of which are The Gentle Art of Blessing, 365 Blessings to Heal Myself and the World, Messages of Life from Death Row, and Listening to Africa. Pierre has lived in or visited 40 countries across every continent. He is based in Geneva, where he writes and runs personal development workshops on how to live a simple yet enriched life incorporating spirituality. And that, my friends, is quantum living. As you have guessed, of course, from the title of the show, today we'll talk about 
the power of blessing. Hello, Pierre. Welcome to Quantum Living. Thank you so much for your time, and it is such a pleasure to have you on my show. Hello, Anna. It's such a joy for me. My speaking to people, communicating, sharing is the greatest joy in my life. And I've been so looking forward to talking to friends in Australia. I visited your country many, many years ago, and I love your country and your people. That's beautiful. Thank you, Pierre. So let's dive right into it. Blessing has been a universal spiritual practice of humankind since time immemorial. There are many forms of blessings. Christianing a brand new ship with a bottle of champagne smashed on its hull. Housewarming party with some green plants brought in for good luck. Blessing of the food we are about to eat. Blessing of the land to produce good crops. A tradition of blessing someone or something that is of giving them a positive energy is widespread. To set the scene for our conversation, I would like to read the opening of your book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, as I think it beautifully captures the essence of your message about blessings. How do you stay spiritually centered in the middle of a noisy street? Or in a smoke-filled restaurant? In a packed subway with a drunkard shouting incoherently at you? How do you keep your spiritual poise during a transatlantic flight with a baby in the seat behind you crying its heart out? How do you keep your calm when someone insults you without reason? Or when a careless driver slams into the side of your new car? How does one feel love rather than pity in a refugee camp with hundreds of starving children pulling at your clothes? Or when the TV news bursts into your living room with pictures of the latest massacre on the other side of the globe? Or when a dictator pours insult and abuse on your country? This book aims to show that spirituality is not a concept to be debated abstractly, but a transforming power that has meaning only when it is lived daily. So, let's start with the most difficult question, Pierre. What is blessing? I love that question. I guess my, my idea is that blessing is one of the oldest spiritual practices of humankind. If we can imagine now ancestors of hundreds of thousands of years ago getting acclimatized to the globe, living in caves with all sorts of menacing forces around them, but also when they started agriculture, gratitude for rain and sun, that made their plants grow, gratitude for children coming on earth. And I imagine these people started expressing gratitude and, and thanking these unknown forces that also brought positive elements into their lives. And little by little, as religions were structured, structured all around the world, people started doing this in a more formal manner. And then in the Jewish tradition and then later in the Christian tradition, this became very much a part of church services. And uh, it also became very ritualized and sometimes rather mechanical and formal. And as often in liturgical practices, the form dominated over the heart. And I was raised myself in, in a church. My father was a minister, so I, I even studied theology, two years theology before sociology. So I have quite an understanding of how religions and churches function. And blessing 
tended to become rather mechanical. And the power of blessing is in the heart. It is a 100% heart practice that doesn't need any religious or churchy setting. It can be done anywhere, at any time, in any circumstances. And the importance is the spontaneity and the deep, deep sincerity. Mary Baker Eddy, who's a thinker I, I have studied and appreciated, once said a sentence that helped me through one of the darkest phases of my life. A deep sincerity is sure of success because God takes care of it. So blessing for me is something very simple, very natural, mm. that you can do in any situation. How did the concept of blessing become so strong in your life and in your teachings? Ah, that is a very important and interesting question. Because, you know, I was raised and I, at the time I discovered blessing, I was a member of a spiritual movement, but there wasn't any emphasis whatsoever on blessing. And then I was living, I was working for a group of NGOs in Switzerland. I'd just come back from Africa and I'd been uh, offered the opportunity to start a program on information on third world issues on developing countries for the schools. And I, I loved my job. I just loved it. And I was so uh, entranced with my job. I had a camp bed in my office. And when I missed the last train in the evening to go home, because I live about 50 miles from where I, where I worked, I would sleep in the office. And at one moment, I wanted to do a roving exhibit for schools on hunger, which is one of the world's greatest problems. Still today, 800 million people go to bed hungry every day in a world that has super abundance of food for everyone because we throw away about one third of all the food produced on earth. And so I told the, my sponsors, look, I'd like to do this roving exhibit. And they said, look, Pierre, we don't have a penny for that. You'll just have to do without it. And I took out of my own savings the equivalent of, I would will say in, in dollars today, I gave the equivalent of 25 to 30,000 US dollars, which I pulled out of my own savings to do this exhibit. The exhibit was applauded by my sponsors. We spoke about on the radio, in the newspapers, etc. And uh, at the same time, I joined, at the time I manage this roving exhibit, I joined a world campaign called the Hunger Project that had started in the United States. And the Hunger Project had a slogan, the end of hunger by the year 2000. My exhibit was ending hunger today, not by the year 2000. And my sponsors detested this, this uh, American campaign uh, because it came from Maybe because it came from the States and they were sort of leftish and suspicious of anything that came from the States. And uh, they forbid me to speak about this campaign in the schools where I was talking. And <laughs> can you imagine how absurd? These are four organizations fighting hunger in the third world, but forbidding me to speak about a world campaign against hunger. Mm. But I, I finally, I, I, I assented, but I continued using the slogan, the end of hunger for the year 2000, because I worked in Africa a long time. I was a founding member of the largest grassroots peasant movement in uh, Africa in the 70s. And one of our grassroots organizations had the same, slo same slogan, the end of hunger by the year 2000. So I thought if it's good for the African farmers, it's good for my work in the schools. And there was one guy in these four organizations who hated me. He hated my guts. He was a militant atheist. And he, uh, he organized his colleagues, his three other colleagues, uh, and decided we had to, they had to get me out of my work. But as they had absolutely nothing to reproach me, on the contrary, they had applauded me for my roving exhibit on Ending Hunger Today. They had a meeting. There were no minutes taken whatsoever. And they told me, look, either you say, you stop saying in schools that we can end hunger by the year 2000, or you quit your job. Now, can you imagine? These are four organizations fighting to end hunger in the, in the third world with programs to help end hunger. 
tell him you're not to speak about the end of hunger. It was absolutely absurd. And so I had a difficult choice. Either I accept something that went against my deepest convictions, or I quit my job. And so I quit my job. And of course, they, they had even planned in advance that this would happen, because they said, knowing, knowing Pierre's integrity, he'll quit his job. And I developed another most incredible resentment. Resentment is something that's like a rat eating your entrails. It's horrible. And it was with me from morning to night. And I was, you know, animosity and uh, resentment against these four organizations, especially the guy who'd uh, concocted this whole scheme to get me out of my job. And I was praying, meditating, doing everything, my mantras, everything. Nothing happened. And for months, this dragged on, and I was miserable. And then one day, suddenly, the verse of Jesus, bless those who curse you. But of course, Pierre, it's so simple. All you have to do is bless them. And on the spot, I started blessing them, blessing them from morning to night in their happiness, in their joy, in their health, in their finances, in their family life, in their work. And suddenly, three months later, I started doing it in the street, at the post office, in the supermarket, everywhere. And it became so joyful, Anna. And I, I used to take the train a lot. I would walk along the whole train from one end to the other, blessing every single person on that train. Can you imagine? <laughs> and I started having very new, interesting, powerful experience with that. So that's how I discovered it. Basically, we understand so little of what is happening in the universe. And the more I advance in life, the more ignorant I feel of this incredible place of such unbelievable complexity, working so incredibly well called our planet or the world, the universe. But I do have a little understanding of love. I once had a very powerful mystical experience that has grounded my whole life and that is a basis of my whole existence. And for me, everything has become so simple since then. The only thing that counts is to grow in love. And for me, blessing is part of that growing in love. Mm. Could you recount that experience, oh, that, sure. the, the story of the vision that grounded your life, as you said? Yes, Anna, with great joy. At the time, I was a member of a healing movement, and I, I tend, had learned how to heal myself with purely spiritual means. And I was, I was attending uh, the board meeting of this large peasant farmer organization I mentioned a little earlier about in Burkina Faso, which is a landlocked country in the Sahel, north of Ghana. And the last day of the meeting, I caught dysentery, and I started working spiritually to try to chase it. And it seemed that it had disappeared in the evening. But the next day, going to the airport, it started again. On the plane, I was working with uh, my mantras, affirmations, spiritual texts, praying, etc. And I was sitting next to an unaccompanied young boy with his little card on his chest with his name, his parents' phone number and address and all the rest. And the stewardess taking care of him was so kind, so loving. I've never seen anything like it. One would have thought he was, she was his mother. She was constantly coming to check that he was okay. And one woman, she came to, to him and she spoke to him with such gentleness. I suddenly felt such incredible gratitude for this woman. And suddenly it became a cosmic gratitude. And all of a sudden I was mentally thrown out of the plane. I was no longer in the plane. I was no longer in time. And I was in this space where there was only the feeling of love. And I insist on the word feeling. Love was the only presence, the only power, the only law, the only substance, the only cause, the only effect. Absolutely everything was love. And the most extraordinary thing is Pierre Pradovan had totally disappeared. I had no longer any conscious consciousness of existing as a Swiss citizen of, in the 40s or 50s, I don't remember, with a passport. The divine consciousness was my consciousness. And I can say that for an indeterminate period, because I was out of time, I didn't know how long it lasted, this divine consciousness was my consciousness. 
And it was all on the level of feeling, not thinking. And suddenly I was black in the plane in my seat. I felt something adjusting in my entrails and in a few seconds, the dysentery disappeared. But of course, the main healing was my vision of the world. And I now see love as this incredibly benevolent power that upholds the universe, that upholds the life of every person and every squirrel and ant and plant of the whole universe. And love will take us home because love put us on this planet. Love is surrounding us. Love is bringing into our experience every single experience we have for our ultimate growth, however tough that experience may seem. Thank you for sharing. Pierre, you said in your book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, it is impossible to bless and judge at the same time just like it is impossible to smile and be angry or be angry and project love at the same time. Would you agree? Well, of course, I, I, I completely agree, evidently. And that's, that's the wonder of blessing, is that it may start in the mind. When I started blessing, it was in the mind to obey what I believed was a revealed commandment. But it soon went down to the heart because blessing is 100% heart energy. But I think one thing that people will, will discover, that as they continue blessing and make it a daily practice, all these negative emotions will tend to recede and ultimately discover. I'm in this privileged position of really having almost no negative emotions, even for people mm. who are not favorite people on the planet, like Donald Trump. Well, I started blessing Donald Trump when he announced his candidacy to the presidency of the United States, so even before he was elected. And I say to him in my, in my mind, brother Donald, I really feel love for someone who's not the favorite person on the planet, because that is the wonderful transformative power of blessing. It eliminates anything negative completely and totally. How important is it to bless oneself? Ah, I know you've laid the finger on the most important issue. It is <laughs> the most important thing. That's the postscriptum of my text on blessing. Mm. Bless the lovely, beautiful person you are. That is the most important, Anna, because we can't give to others what we don't give to ourselves. Absolutely. Pierre, what is your favorite blessing, if you have one, and why? And it's, I went through, I spent ages last night going through my book and tried to, and there's so many I love, but there's one special one by John O'Donoghue, the Irish writer and poet, who's a, a master, I call John the master of blessing. His language is crafted so carefully. So let me, lead, can I lead, uh, read one? Of course, please do. It, it's, as a matter of fact, it's, Day 100 in my book, 365 Blessings to Heal Myself and the World. So very easy to remember. Number 100, a blessing by John O'Donoghue. May you listen to your longing to be free. May the frames of your belonging be large enough for the dreams of your soul. May you arise each day with a voice of blessing whispering in your heart, something good is going to happen to you. May you find harmony between your soul and your life. May the mansion of your soul never become a haunted place. May you know the eternal longing that lies at the heart of time. May there be kindness in your gaze when you look within. May you never place walls between the light and yourself. May you be set free from the prisons of guilt, fear, disappointment and despair. May you allow the wild beauty of the invisible world to gather you, mind you, and embrace you in belonging. There's one sentence, and as I reread frequently, because I'm still, I'm still working on learning to love myself, when he says, may there be kindness in your gaze when you look within. So I asked all the people listening to this program, is there kindness? when you look within the beautiful person you are. 
And can you say even, I am beautiful? My meditation this morning, I, I believe that the sense of uh, identity is the most important thing on the spiritual path. And this morning, my meditation was, is uh, what I did do it in French. I have to translate it into to, to English. I am light. I am totally love. I am entirely divine. And I just go over these three statements very slowly, pondering them, not with the mind, but with the heart. I am light. I am total love. I am entirely divine. And repeat that statement slowly. And little by little, you'll feel a deep sense of rest and contentment springing up inside you. Mm, that's beautiful, beautiful and powerful. And I guess that this potentially would be a blessing that you would recommend everyone to give to themselves every morning. You are so right, Anna, of course. <laughs> More important than breakfast. Even. <laughs> Absolutely. If I may, Pierre, I would like to tell you what is my favorite blessing from your yes, book. Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> and, I'll know. and I'll tell you why. I would like to read now your blessings for the homeless, which, uh, I, which I especially like for two reasons. One, whenever I see a homeless person, I instinctively bless them. To me, homelessness in this day and age is one of the most inexplicable, painful, and shameful human tra tragedies, but not shameful for the homeless person, but for everyone else that allows it. And secondly, it beautifully demonstrates your approach to blessing, which includes people and organizations connected somehow to the person or situation that you are blessing. So if you allow me, I would like to read it mm -hmm. now. Blessing for the homeless. I bless those whom circumstances of life have driven to live in the streets or in derelict basements and other abandoned places. I bless them in their courage to hang in there until the circumstances of their life take an upturn for the better, knowing that I may be part of that improvement. I bless the authorities of the city and small town that they may provide shelters for the homeless. I bless restaurants and all stores which sell food that they may donate what they no longer need to the homeless and destitute. I bless those with open hearts who search the streets and alleys for those who need assistance and help them find places where they can stay. I bless the employers and others who have jobs to offer that they may think also of the destitute when providing work. And above all, I bless the homeless that they may see themselves not as poor victims needing assistance, but as children of the universe here to move the hearts of their fellow humans to deepen compassion and more active love. Thank this you. Is such a Anna. beautiful, beautiful and very touching blessing. And, and I would like to add, Anna, that among these homeless, there are millions of street children, literally millions. I've lived in the third world for many years, and I know the plight of these children, and I, on the board of an extraordinary little NGO, which has done the most incredible work in Bolivia, amongst others with these street children. Mm. If I may add something very important, is that when one blesses, one should never come from pity, but from compassion and love. When you come from pity, you are accepting a situation as terrible and you're accepting that the person is really suffering from that 
which humanly they are, but spiritually, blessing is uplifting the person, despite whatever may appear by seeing them as now, already now, in their divine selfhood. You never accept the appearance as a fact. You claim the spiritual perfection of the person or the situation or the event. That's very important. I totally agree. So the intention coming from the heart, what else? What is another ingredient of a blessing? If someone would ask you, someone who has never thought of a blessing being given other than by priests in church. It's interesting that you mentioned that because people, so many people have told me, oh, but only priests can, can bless. That this is ridiculous because Jesus himself was speaking to a large crowds when he said, bless those who curse you. And he didn't preach blessing to 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 priests or to to whoever led the the synagogue, the rabbis or whatever. He talked to the simple people in the street. So I would say, well, the first ingredient is the sense of compassion. But compassion, not in the sense of taking in the suffering of the other person, but projecting their wholeness in your own thought, claiming and seeing them as already the perfect child of the universe, already in their abundance, be it abundance of health, of home, of income, of whatever. Absolutely. Would you say that blessing benefits you if you bless someone? Of course. And, and or the person you are blessing on both? Well, evidently both. You are blessed abundantly because you are enlarging your compassion. You are extending the walls of your heart. And evidently, if we bless other people, it's because we know it's going to do them good. I have a website on blessing, simply called gentleartofblessing.org. Gentleartofblessing, all in one word, dot org. And there is a whole section on blessing on healings, healings through blessing, and it is especially in the field of human relationships that uh, blessing has manifested itself to be something very powerful. There are also wonderful examples of healing of medical problems. Could I mention one of my very, very favorite healings? Please do. This is the, the head of a large supermarket in Switzerland, who is one of the two largest supermarket chains in the whole country, and he fell into a deep depression. And he had to go to clinic, and he was stuffed with all these big pharma drugs and all that stuff. And slowly, slowly he improved. And finally, he was able to come out of clinic. And after a few weeks or months, he started sliding down back into depression. And he ran to his psychiatrist because he was so desperate. And uh, I'd like all psychiatrists to listen to this, uh, because in Switzerland, the, the, the main thing they do is just give drugs to people. And uh, his doctor said, look, Mr. Let's call him Ulman, doesn't matter. Look, Mr. Ulm, I refuse to give you any drugs. This is what I'm going to prescribe to you. And he gave his client my book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, And also a cut started <laughs> book, The Power of Now. Wow. And the guy went home and he read the book and he started blessing, blessing, blessing. And it completely pulled him out of his depression. And he wrote to me saying, you know, as boss of a large supermarket store, I have opportunities the whole day to bless. I'm not yet selling my book. And I don't think many psychiatrists are distributing it. But I found it very beautiful story. Yes, it is a beautiful story and powerful too, which leads me to my next question. As I was reading your book, The Gentle Art of Blessing, which, by the way, is an absolute pleasure to read, and I would recommend everyone to get a copy because it is an experience, I think I can put it this way. So, as I was reading it, a question came up in my mind. 
You said across your book in few places that it may take a long time for a blessing to take effect, and in some other places you said that it often takes a moment. I find this dichotomy quite interesting, so could you please speak to this for a moment? How long does it take for the benefits of a blessing to be noticed, to realize? Yes, Anna, I love your question. I'd like to proceed my reply by saying that I believe that we live in a benevolent universe and that everything that happens to us, somehow we attract it to ourselves to, so as to grow and learn the lesson that we needed to learn. Uh, Eckhart Tolle says something similar to that when he writes that we should face every situation as if we had chosen it. So let me, for instance, when I started blessing this guy, uh, this atheist guy who forced me to quit my job, it took me three years of blessing, three years of constant blessing to heal myself of any resentment. But then 10 years later, I met this gentleman in a meeting in Lausanne. I, I live in Geneva. And Anna, I felt like embracing this man and kissing him. I felt the most incredible burst of joy, one of the most incredible in my whole lifetime. We had dinner together. It was very warm and cordial. And for days, my heart was singing, singing, singing. And it took me a long time to discover, but why on earth did this happen? How on earth was it possible? And I have this, the belief, Anna, I believe that before coming on earth, somehow we choose our incarnation. And I believe this gentleman and I, before we came on earth, we both chose our respective roles, and he chose to persecute me so that I would discover this specific, special form of blessing this, that since then has touched hundreds of thousands of people around the, the globe. When I say that figure, on the homepage of the website, there is the most beautiful, beautiful video on blessing by our webmaster, Jane Young, which has touched hundreds of thousands of people on blessing. And mm. there's a a whole section, a whole paragraph in my text on blessing, which says this, I'll, re I'll read it. When something goes completely askew in your day, some unexpected event knocks down your plans, and you too also, burst into blessing, for life is teaching you a lesson. And the very event you believe to be unwanted, you yourself call forth so as to learn the lesson you might balk against were you not to listen, were you not to bless it. Trials are blessings in disguise, and hosts of angels follow in their path. The bell you hear is that of the little church next to my home. So I believe, you know, I chose this somehow before coming on earth to learn the specific lesson I needed to learn. Thank you for sharing this, Pierre, and I personally have the same view <laughs> or a life philosophy that uh, uh, that we keep coming back to learn and to grow and that we create our reality not only at, during our lifetime but in between the incarnations as well. And this interestingly leads me to my next question which perhaps is a difficult one but I somehow feel compelled to ask this question. As you have said, and many other great teachers have said, and I know this too, that every situation in our life serves us at some level as a lesson or experience, even if it is painful to go through. Now, my question is, what if the pain, whether physical or emotional or both, especially when it lasts for a very long time, becomes unbearable at some point and we feel that we cannot and don't want to cope with it anymore. And yes, I'm talking here about a thought or even a decision to end one's life when we feel that we have nothing left inside to keep going and so we give up in spite of that awareness that this is just a lesson or an experience but 
of course, it is very, very real to us. So if someone going through such a situation is listening to this show, what would you like to say to them? Oh, Anna, thank you for this question. Thank you. It is so important. As you know, there, there is a blessing in my book on those who are tempted by suicide. I went through, at one period in my life, I went through the dark, dark valley of the shadow of death when everything crumbled. I had the most wonderful marriage and I, I, I live with the, the most wonderful woman, my wife, who is the person I admire most on earth. She runs, at 80, she runs an NGO which has an, a small foundation which has a world impact. And I left the, the family apartment from one day to another. Then my energy fell to pieces. I must say, at the time I was running very successful workshops, acknowledged as a writer, acknowledged as a humanitarian who had taken on the defense of an African American, African American death row inmate in Texas with great success, gotten him off death row. I was applauded for many of the things I was doing, and all that fell to the ground. My energy dropped. I'd been living without recourse to modern medicine for 40 years. I had to go to the doctor and had the worst health challenge of, of my whole lifetime. Hence, my energy dropped. So my workshops almost fell through. My income, as a result, fell oh, well over 50%. And finally, my spiritual path of over 30 years exploded in a thousand pieces, fell to smithereens. And for three years, Anna, three years, I was in the valley of the shadow of death with suicidal thoughts and everything. What, this great, this great trainer going through something like this? Yes. And today, Anna, I give thanks because the spiritual path I was on was very rigid and narrow. And it hemmed me in in many different ways. And today, I'm grateful I do not belong to any spiritual movement, church, religion, whatsoever. I am an independent spiritual thinker. I am. I have started my workshops, continued in my workshops again. I continue writing, and especially my relationship with my wife is something so extraordinary. It's a daily blessing, and it has made me understood and really understand and live what unconditional love is. So for three years, I was this in this valley of the shadow of death. And one of the statements that helped me was this uh, statement I quoted right at the beginning by Mary Baker Eddy, a deep sincerity is sure of success, for God takes care of it. I knew I was sincere in my searching for a higher sense of truth and love and life, and uh, that helped me hold on because there were moments I didn't even see how I could possibly get out of what seemed like a, a deep, deep canyon with granite wall, and you could barely see the sky at the top. And yet, today, I say thank you for that experience. So what would you say to someone who is going through that uh, deep shadow valley and just feels that they cannot take the pain any longer? What could you give them? What would you say to them that would help them to go through and not give up? I've been befriending this black African-American former death row inmate for 23 years. And this man is quite extraordinary. Uh, his letters, we started corresponding in 1997. His letters were so amazing. I published a whole selection of, this, of these letters in French, and the book was later translated into Dutch, and I rewrote it in English. In English, it's available under the title Messages of Life from Death Row on Amazon. And uh, this man went through 25 years of death row for a crime we know he never committed. And death row, Texas, is the end of hell. They live in tiny little cells, six by 10 feet, with practically no daylight. There's a tiny slit against the roof, but you have to climb on top of your bunk and roll the, the tiny mattress to be able to get a, a tiny glimpse of the outside. Uh, you are in total isolation 
for years and years, my friend Roger McGowan, that is his name, didn't have the slightest human contact, physical contact. He occasionally had a visitor who visited him. I visited him every year, once a year. And he went through total hell. And this man, he wrote to me one of his letters. Uh, during my three years in the Valley of Death, I had this, this statement on my desk. I'm hanging by my right hand on a rope. My left arm has been tied behind my back. And somebody is pulling me by my feet. But I hang in there, I hang in there, I hang in there. I'd say to that person, Anna, hang in there. If you are sincere, if you are honest, you will pull through. You will pull through. It's a promise of the universe. Thank you. That was very, very powerful. I'd like to mention again the name of the book. Yes. Messages of Life from Death Row. Because the, this book, especially the, the French and English editions, have transformed hundreds of lives around the planet. I have a, a woman in Switzerland. She just received a modest inheritance. She sent me 50,000 US dollars as a result of just reading this one book. Mm. So it's a very powerful book. Yes, it is. I will, of course, include in the show notes on my website uh, all the links to your websites, to your Facebook groups and places where people can purchase your wonderful books. So all information will be there. Pierre, what is the most unusual or surprising blessing that you have come up with amongst the 365 or more, I suspect, wonderful blessings that people question you about or are curious about? Is there, is there one uh, in, in particular that stands out? Yes, it's a blessing for making love. Okay. I think it's something very, very special. I, I say, mention this blessing because it's, uh, you know, people think about how can you, how can you bless something like making love? I mean. <laughs> I believe that you can bless absolutely everything in life. There's not a single situation that's that right. you cannot bless. And that's the wonderful thing about blessing. It applies to absolutely everything. And then afterwards, I will read another blessing, which is also a bit surprising. Okay. A blessing for making love. May our lovemaking be a perfect expression of your love for us, an experience of ecstatic beauty and profound depth. May we put our partner's pleasure before our own and be most sensitive to their most subtle wish and hidden desire. May our bodies become instruments playing music for your glory and our hearts be filled with the music of the soul. May we in the rush of busy lives find refreshment for our souls, a sigh of peaceful rest for our bodies and a special moment of green pastures for our deeper being. May it cement our togetherness in a unique way. True lovemaking restores both body and soul, while at the same time being a gentle playground for the child in us. And above all, may it strengthen our commitment of faithfulness to each other in the understanding that we are both each other's keeper and the keepers of our spoken and unspoken vows.
Ah, oh, how beautiful. So I think it's to, to stress that, you know, really everything, you can bless absolutely everything. I have another one on blessing financial speculators. I think it's important that people realize that less than 3% of all financial exchanges in the world, less than 3% are for real exchanges of goods and services. 97% is pure speculation. It's just totally insane. And these speculators, you know, often I have a friend who worked in a bank and he told me, Pierre, a boat of wheat coming from Canada to Le Havre in France can change owners well over a hundred times during its trip. This is just insane. So here is a, a blessing for financial speculators. We bless all those who channel their divinely bestowed precious life energy into financial speculation in the hope of immediate financial returns. We bless them in their understanding that no real gains can ever be made at the cost of others, and that because of the law of right returns, i.e. that one reaps what one sows, they will one day have to come face to face with the results of their activities. We bless them so that despite the frantic rush and electric atmosphere of trading rooms, the discreet but persistent voice of truth may eventually reach them and lead them to ask, but what on earth am I really doing? And what am I doing to my soul? We bless them in their true sense of wealth that they may come to grasp that all true abundance comes from within not without, and that what they give to others, not what they take, constitutes their true wealth. We bless them in the courage needed to denounce illegal activities, if they even in favor of the group or bank they work for, and to resist the resulting pressure on themselves to just keep quiet. We bless them in their grasp of the new win-win paradigm, percolating through the nooks and crannies of the system which one day will overturn the tired, old, win-lose, me-first model which has run a great part of the world for so long. Above all, we bless them in their consciousness of their perfect divine identity and indissoluble oneness with their divine source. And we bless ourselves in our own financial integrity that we may aim at our highest sense of what is right in all our own financial affairs, from what we pay a student working his way through college for tending our garden or purchasing and selling stocks and other financial transactions. Wonderful blessing. It really is. It is unusual and wonderful. People yes. often say, may all your wishes come true. And I feel like saying, may all your blessings come true. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's because, great. Pierre, if if that happened, then we would be living in a in the most wonderful world. Will happen one day. It will. I really believe that one day <laughs> it will happen. It will happen. Now, Pierre, quoting from your book, the act of blessing triggers some of the fundamental spiritual laws governing the universe. And these are the law of positive expectations, the law of unconditional love, the law of right returns, and there is also the golden rule. Would you like to speak to those laws? Well, I think that that is one of the more powerful aspects of, of blessing, is that it activates a whole series of basic spiritual laws that exist for our good, and especially the the law of right returns to uh, unto others as you would have done unto yourself. And blessing is just, you don't have to think of these laws when you are blessing, but you can know that when you are blessing, it activates these laws in a wonderful way. And in the most amazing situations, let me tell you of an experience uh, a dear friend of mine had. She's a uh, an, an MD, an anesthetist, mm -hmm. and uh, 
she went on a humanitarian mission, uh, unpaid uh, mission to, to Niger. In the, Niger is one of the landlocked countries of the Sahel, north of Nigeria. And it's a country where there have been Tuareg rebels in the north opposing the government. These are not jihadists. There. These are not to be confused with the Islamic jihadists. They are rebels of the Tuareg tribes who are the original inhabitants of the Sahara. She went to a small hospital in the north, which had, hadn't had a, an anesthetist for a very, very long time. And there was a whole list of operations of people waiting to be operated. And she got down to work immediately and had very busy days. And one day, they, they were a small team. They were going back to their camp when they were stopped by Tuareg rebels who uh, got into the, the Land Rover and told them to, to drive to the Tuareg stronghold. And she was facing a 14-year-old Tuareg rebel with his uh, machine gun or whatever it's called pointed at her chest. And you can imagine she didn't feel quite secure. And it's already happened regularly over the years that uh, people have been uh, kidnapped by these groups and then they ask for a large sum of money from the French government to release them. And she had discovered the gentle art of blessing shortly before that and was so enthusiastic about it, she sent the book or the one-page text on blessing to some very dear friends. And uh, they were in the camp, they got to the camp, and they were sitting in that Land Rover just wondering what was going to happen to them, what was happened to their mission. And it was so distressing. And suddenly, the chief of all the rebels, the, the big rebel chief, came to the Land Rover and simply said, you can return to your camp. And they were just stunned. They didn't understand. Why on earth? And they drove out of the camp, looking backwards the whole time, thinking, well, they might change their mind. But no, and they were free. Shortly after this event, she corresponded with one of the friends with, to whom she had sent the gentle out of blessing. And he told her, just that day, just at the time they were arrested, he felt a deep, deep need to start blessing her. And I can't help believing that this release was the result of his blessing. I mean, over 30 years, I've been receiving uh, stories from the whole world, and uh, I can't help believing this is more than a coincidence. That's the power of love. Yes, exactly. Unconditional love. How beautiful. Pierre, I don't know whether you are familiar with the ancient Hawaiian practice of reconciliation and forgiveness called Ho'oponopono. Oh, yes, of course. I you love are. I, I, would, yes. <laughs> I would have thought so, which was created uh, by Mor Morna, Morna Nalamaku Simeona, if I pronounce it well, in the 1970s, and Dr. Hugh Len has written exactly. extensively about it. And just for our listeners who are not um, familiar with it, it is a mantra when one repeats the words, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, not necessarily in this order as a form of mental and spiritual clearing that could be compared to a Buddhist technique of clearing karma. This Ho'oponopono technique has been defined as a forgiveness and reconciliation practice, cleansing of errors of thought, the origin of problems and sickness in the physical world, according to the Hawaiian worldview. And the literal translation is to put it right, to rectify. So, I think you would agree that this is a form of blessing. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, I gave a workshop on spiritual healing in which I spoke about Ho'oponopono oh, and, and blessing <laughs> we get together. So, of course, of course, ultimately, you know, it's a question of words. Blessing is wanting real good for the other person from the bottom of your heart. Okay? Very simple. It's wanting the real good of the other person from the very bottom of your heart. So it is 100% heart energy. I insist on this because mm. I used to be very intellectual in my spiritual approach in this movement I told you of which I was a member for over 30 years in which 
completely crumbled when I had this experience of the valley of death. And now my religion, if I can say, quotes my spirituality, I, I don't belong to any religion. My spirituality is one just of heart energy. The only thing that matters for me, the only thing is learning to love a little more every day. And that is the whole of my spirituality. And my life has become so simple, Anna, so simple. What would be your final thought for our listeners that you would like to share with us? I'd like to finish with a short story that a friend shared with me recently. I was having doubts about my efficiency, my impact on, on society, and especially if I compare my, myself to my incredible wife who works 60 to 70 hours a week running this uh, foundation which has had a world impact i i consider sometimes i i used to consider sometimes i really wasn't doing so much and she told me the story of this uh, of this great guru who had touched hundreds of thousands of lives who had a large movement he had hundreds of thousands of disciples in the world and he had helped so many people lead better lives and he was so respected and finally he left for heaven and um, he was received there with very special honors. And uh, he asked, why? He asked God, you know, why do you receive me with such uh, honors? I mean, I'm not the first guru to, to perform things like this. And uh, God said to him, oh, it's not at all because of what you did with your hundreds of thousands of peoples and your preaching and writing. The reason you're received with such honors is that one day you were going along the road on your, on your horse and your, you saw a snail in the middle of the road. You stopped your horse, you got down, and you picked up that snail and you put it in, in a field a hundred yards beside the road so that no car would ever risk running over it. That's why you're received with such honors. And I love. Oh, I love this story. My whole <laughs> sense of stress just dropped away from uh, one second to another. So, my friends, remember blessing, maybe your snail, okay? <laughs> wow, what a, what a great story. <laughs> and, and so fitting for, to, um, to end the show. Beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. And Pierre, Thank you so much. It's been such an honor to have you on my show. This was oh. really amazing. And we could be talking for hours, I'm sure. Yes. And thank you for, for the most wonderful work that you do that helps raise the frequency of our energy of so many people around the world and helps us to uh, live better lives. It was just undiluted joy for me to share with you, Anna, for this couple of hours. Just tro total joy. All the best to you and thank you for the, the important work you're doing in raising world consciousness. That is the number one most important thing on the planet today, raising world consciousness. And you are an important part of that activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre. And may all your blessings come true. Thank you, Anna. God bless you and all your listeners. Thank you. Thank you. If this conversation has raised any issues for you about life and death, please contact your local crisis or mental health support center, your doctor or the nearest hospital without delay. In Australia, you can call Lifeline on 131114 or Beyond Blue on 1300 224636. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, 
keep your vibrations high and be well. <laughs>